Greetings, everyone. Pete Pardo here from Seat Tranquility. Welcome to another episode of In the Prog Seat. Our topic tonight is our favorite guitar solos, prog, fusion, prog metal. We've got in the house, Mr. Lewis Nasser, Stephen Reed, George Lemmy, our center square, Anthony Ferraro, Chuck Alvarez, Eric Porter, and the, pro the professor, the professor of prog, <laughs> Ken Golden from the Laser's Edge, the progressor. He is progressive. I see, there George, you you're in my, you're my middle man. It only counts what I see. So, Anthony, you are, you are, I know. The, you are the center square tonight. So we've each uh, picked out five of our favorite guitar solos for all of Prague world. And uh, I'm sure we're going to have some really cool picks tonight. So we're going to go in the exact order that I just named everybody. So we're going to go Lewis, Stephen, George, Anthony, Chuck, Eric, Ken and myself, and around and around we go until we get to number one. So, Lewis, kick us off with your <clears throat> five. All right. So, it's very difficult for me to rank these in a particular order because we're talking about the top of the top and it becomes so subjective, right? But I guess if I have to start somewhere, um, and by the way, I'm not going to pick any of the obvious choices because I figure that some of you guys would do it. And, um, and I know that my my brother George is going to take care of all the fusion guys. So this is going to be, you know, it, it frees me up to talk about some other things that have connected with me more through the years. And um, for my first one, I want to, I want to give a shout out to uh, Michael Romeo. Um, in particular, the album that, that really made me realize he's just a, an off the chain, brilliant guitar player and composer was um was V, but when I really just started to hang on his guitar was when he, they, they got all the way out to Paradise Lost. And in fact, even though the, the title track is a, is a ballad and a softy and it's, it's not approved by George, I think that, um, and the solo is brilliant, I think that the guitar solo in A Serpent's Kiss from Paradise Lost nice. is just, you know, what can you say? This guy is... And you know when, when you when you go see them live, he delivers. He doesn't take shortcuts. He doesn't fuck around. He plays every note, and he and he plays it, you know, as it should be played. So I am a big fan. Been for years. Michael Romeo, Symphony X, the guitar solo from A Serpent's Kiss from the album Paradise Lost. Nice. Mm -hmm. my favorite album by them, and quite possibly my favorite song from that album. Great choice. Great choice. All right, Mr. Reed, you're up. Wow, how difficult was this? This yeah. was so hard. Yeah. Um, so I really just kind of chose things that move me. They're probably not the most technical, mm -hmm. dazzling solos. There are people out there that can probably do more, if you want more. Um, and ranking them, as Lewis says, <laughs> so difficult. So by virtue of not being able to find a physical one to do this with, Number five on my list is, well, most people are going to go, he's on the wrong show, because I'm going to say Mike Oldfield, you know, but Mike Oldfield can play guitar. The guy can seriously play. Um, and Incantations was the album that I went for, and it's part three, which is a whole side. Uh, you're looking at something that's about 17 minutes long, and half of that, although there's obviously beautiful melodies and textures and lots of synth work, what's telling the story is a fantastic guitar solo. And it's just, it's something that's never highlighted about what he does. I know he's got some much more guitar oriented albums, mm -hmm. but on one that is probably more synth based, that's a phenomenal piece of guitar work. And the criteria I went for, and really, I mean, I've got honorable mentions and various things that could all have slotted in the top five, was just pieces where I think, you know, I can't think of anything else in there that would improve it. And that's a, a perfect example for me. So. Yeah, Incantations Part 3 from Mike Oldfield is my number five. I, I don't think he plays with a pick, if I, if I remember correctly. He uses really. um, figures. Mm -hmm. yep. yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it changes, I think, the tone of what he does as well, the way that it, it, it kind of comes across. Yeah. Do you know, it's a very identifiable sound that he has when he plays, uh, and I like that too. Cool. Good choice. All right, George. All right. Uh, I love John Petrucci, even though sometimes he kind of annoys me with, he kind of plays it safe, I feel like. He's he's like cyborg-like precision, but sometimes he just relies on uh, back to his repertoire. You know, he doesn't stretch out enough, not wild enough. 
So I, I could say a lot of songs about him, but I picked one where he kind of goes for the feels. It's from this album, a song called Best of Times. Um, mm. uh, uh, losing a Parent. And he, it's a build up kind of a solo, starts out establishing and just builds up to a climax. Uh, I feel like it's a different kind of thing for him as instead of the usual where he's just pounding you. But uh, for me, that's that's my number five, best of times. Good choice. And that's uh, Black Clouds and Silver Linings, right? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, when it comes to Petrucci, he's got a lot of great solos, but I, I kind of like the ones that really tell a story. And you, you really have to kind of search for those, right? Because so many of his solos are just all about like, technical precision and like you said they just go for the jugular and like you want something that's just a little bit memorable right so yeah, yeah. good choice yeah. all right anthony our center square all right well uh since Luis said he was going to save all the big guns for us so i'm going to start off with number five yes from the yes album yours is no disgrace by steve howe that solo to me is just so iconic i mean i know he has iconic <laughs> solos but 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 to me it's it, it moves me. There's a mood to it. Uh, sometimes you wonder if he's actually from planet Earth or if he's not from the planet of Sun Hill. So uh, I'm going with number five. Yours is no disgrace. Steve Howe. You just had to throw that in, right? <laughs> I think we can all be safe in assuming that he's not from Sun Hill. <laughs> his karma and his energy in a different level. But I like that solo very much. Yeah, it's oh, it's one. awesome. It's awesome. That's a great one. All right, Chuck, what do you got for it? All right, well, my number five is from the master, Frank Zappa, from his leather album, Redunzel. What's that, um, that solo that he does on there and so, you know, what's a, just that that earthy, gritty sound of his and so, um, and what's it, you know, Frank Zappa, you know, he's no, not mostly mentioned as a great soloist. And so, you know, people, which he's a great guitarist, but I also find him to be a great soloist as well. These are one of the many songs um, what's it, that I love from him and that always um, grabs me. And so, so my, my number five is Redunzo from the Leather album, Frank Zappa. Great choice. Mm -hmm. yeah. He's got lots of great solos. Oh, so many. He does. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, Eric. Yeah. Well, with mine, uh, don't punish me for not doing homework, but when you um, let me know that I was going to be on the show, Pete, I quickly just wrote down about 10 or 12 songs that the solos really moved me. I didn't want to have to think about this. I kind of felt like I should be able to call these up, uh, no problem. So this guitarist, um, I love his work in The Aristocrats. Uh, it's Guthrie Govan. But for this solo, there's actually two songs on this album that I love, but I'm going to go with The Watchmaker from mm -hmm. The Raven That Refused to Sing. Beautiful. Um, and the song itself, it's really kind of like a Genesis with a lot of acoustic guitar and the buildup into this solo and the solo just takes off. I mean, there's some really nice moments. He flies. He's got some great legato runs in that song. Drive Home is also a great solo, but this I, I just think the watchmaker I immediate that immediately came to me when I thought of him. So that's my number five. Cool. Even Wilson's masterpiece. Mm -hmm. Oh, what a great album. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, actually, truth be told, I prefer it's just me. I prefer his solo stuff over Porcupine Tree. And it's just me. You know, that's the way I feel. You know, even I, I agree with that last album. Mm -hmm. Well, not the last one, but the, the, all the other ones. I think they're much better. The last wow. album was a flaming turd. Well, I'll, I'll do it. Yeah, I love the last album. There you go. We, we, we could have gone there last week. <laughs> I love That's it. That's right. <laughs> but truth, truth be told, I had to make a decision to go see The Raven at the Keswick or UK reunion in Philly. So I went to go see Jobson and the boys. Of course. Oh, Jobson. Oh, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't take long, right? <sighs> they were on the, the concerts were on the same day, actually. Of course. <laughs> decisions, decisions. All right, Ken, what do you got um, for your first choice? Before we get into it, can I? Uh, I just wanted to mention a uh, we lost a great guitar player yesterday. Yes. Yes. Pat, mm -hmm. Pat Martino passed away. Mm -hmm. yes. And uh, he was from Philadelphia. 
and he was um, uh, he was a student of Dennis Sandol, who was also uh, a teacher for Scott McGill, and uh, and Dennis Sandol was John Coltrane's teacher, and um, Pat was just a remarkable play, uh, remarkable player, and if you know his story, had a brain aneurysm in, in the early seventies, and he lost the ability to play, he lost his memory. And he had to relearn how to play guitar by listening to his albums. So if people who are watching this are unfamiliar with Pat and you like jazz rock, if you like fusion, I just wanted to mention him and just hold up a few albums that you, you should check out. Not going to go into a heavy discourse about them. Uh, this is one of his early ones. It's called uh, Bayina and it's a uh, heavy psychedelic album. It's very interesting, very interesting album. Another great one which uh, he did with the guys from Catalyst, Consciousness, beautiful album. I thought about including this in my list from Pat Martino Live, but I decided not to do any live albums tonight. Uh, there's a sidelong piece called Special Door, which is extraordinary. And then in the mid seventies, Pat got into fusion. He got head on to fusion. There's a great CD you should track down. It's called First Light. It combines Joyous Lake and Starbright. And uh, if you like Return to Forever or all the all the classic '70s fusion, this is this is essential stuff. So anyway, I just wanted to say thank you, Pat. Yeah, this, rest in peace, Pat. Yeah, yeah, he, uh, yeah he, had, uh, he was he was brilliant. So um, I think we said that this was not really an easy show to do because there's just so many you could pick and. You know, I, I figured this is like the first of like a five part series that, uh, you know, um, so I asked the head of the Tranquility Temple, you know, what uh, what are the parameters? And he said, you know, confine it to Prague and Prague metal and fusion. So I'm not going to I'm not going to rant about Robin Trower or Richie Blackmore tonight. I'm sorry. Uh, so uh, there's also no real order to my top five because I have another top five, which are just as good. Yeah. Uh, these are all kind of random. So my first one for tonight is going to be from Joe's Garage, Act 2 and 3, Frank mm -hmm. Zappa, Watermelon and Easter Hay. It's, yeah. you know, it's, his finest it's, hour. it's one of his, you know, it's one of his great guitar solos. Frank had so many great guitar solos. I mean, the guy put out a three LP set of nothing but guitar solos. And any one of them would have been, you know, in your top five. So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, what makes that better than like Rat Tomago or your mama? One of the nothing, no, nothing's you know, they're all they're all amazing. I mean, we could do we could do a Frank Zappa night, right? If you haven't been in a room, that'd be awesome. Oh, yes, yeah, I'll, <laughs> I'll be down with that. Yeah, so anyway, so I, you know, this one makes a lot of people's top, and it's a it's it's a great, great solo, it's kind of lengthy and. <laughs> The other thing for me, I wanted to point out, I didn't really pick much. I really didn't pick any metal tonight because for me, I find that for a great guitar solo, it has to be emotion driven. And I find that with a lot of the metal bands and take it from a guy who listens to a lot of prog metal, there's a technical element, which for some bands and some players robs that emotional content. You know, it's more, I hear more of an ensemble and I'm hearing the keyboards, I'm hearing the guitar playing off one another, as opposed to like when we talk about like the glory days of, of Prague, old school Prague, where somebody kind of takes takes the space and, and, and plays and plays out a solo. So anyway, that's where I'm coming from tonight. It's gonna be it's all of my picks are gonna have gonna have very much that like um, what I call like that emotional aspect that uh, uh, Watermelon needs to hang. That's my number five. Nice. I almost kind of like the idea of doing an all Zappa favorite guitar solo show because there's just so many. To choose. There's so many. There's yeah. so many. There's so I mean, many. he. Yeah. There, there was there was nobody else like him. Yeah. You know? And the other right. thing, the other thing we should say about Frank though is that you know, like, I'm shying away from live tonight because within the live context, a lot of these guitarists really shine and they stretch out. You know. And with Frank, it's almost hard to differentiate between live and studio because he'll take it all and he'll mash it together and splice it up. And, you know, so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They've said that a lot of his 
some of his best guitar solos on these studio albums were actually taken from the show. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, isn't that the whole idea behind the project object that he was trying to construct, you know, music by playing various ideas all over the world, recording them, blending them, and then iterating them, and then pushing them forth in the next show? It's the level of genius of that guy is is is, is just next level, right? Yeah. So. Yeah, totally. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. All right, my first choice for today. And yes, uh, I, this was really hard. Uh, kind of like what Eric did initially, I just said, all right, let me just try not to make this too difficult and just throw stuff off the top of my head onto a document and see how many I come up with. And then I started thinking about it and thinking about it. And before you know it, I had like 20 and 25. And then I'm like, all right, well, there's a certain few that are like iconic that I love, but I know others are going to mention. So I tried to go a little bit further than that, but still pay homage to the ones that I really love a lot. So this first one, uh, I'm going to go with a guy who we unfortunately never really heard a lot from in his very short lifespan. But I think what he did contribute to the handful of albums that he was on was tremendous. And for me, I think none better than on uh, Billy Cobham's Spectrum album, Tommy Bolin, Quadrant 4. Mm -hmm absolutely blistering solo arguably his best on any album we're talking his solo albums james gang alphonse muzon or deep purple. deep purple there's something about quadrant four you got you know billy's just crazy drumming and just jan hammer and tommy bolin just dueling it out to the death it's just absolutely amazing it's one of the best four minutes and 20 seconds you'll ever hear. Mm -hmm. when it's very it intense. Oh, yeah. Just mm -hmm. unbelievable. Just uh, it's amazing. So, uh, yeah, that is my choice for number one. Billy Cobb and Spectrum's featuring the late, great Tommy Bolin. Back Speaking to of Tommy Bolin, Ken, I got to order that Alfonso was on mind transplant oh, from you. You're going to love it. You're going to love it. It's ridiculous. You're going to love it. All right. right. So what do you got? So for my next one, I'm going to pick a band from New York who are not, you know, in, enormous, although I, I, I feel they should be. Um, the, the band is called Consider the Source. Um, they, it's a trio. It's basically bass, drums, and guitar, except that both the bass and the guitar have, you know, insanely enormous pedal boards, which means that they, at any point in time, they can become anything and and they do and it's it, it's like it's it, it's a thing of beauty and and the guitarist in question is um gabriel marin okay uh i guess americans would call him gabriel marin but um he uh he's uh he's a student of bumblefoot mm. and um this this band if you've never seen them live i i cannot recommend it enough because at the drop of a hat they're gonna go from just blistering you know, 27 fourths craziness to this very relaxed jazz where suddenly he's playing, he plays in a, on a double neck guitar and just like Bumblefoot, he's got the fretted and the fretless. He'll just start hitting up a trombone solo on the fretless part of the guitar that is killer while playing harmonics on the, on the bottom of it. And meanwhile, the other two guys, the drummer is an in, insanely brilliant drummer, but he's overshadowed constantly by these two freaks, Ferrara and Mani. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. I, um, I would highly recommend that anybody who watches this um, just go to their band camp and just buy their records. Um, this is from my choice for the, the, a, a good sampler to start, although every song is, is truly a masterclass, is um, Many Words of Disapproval from the album World War Trio, parts two and three. I'm seeing them, Lewis, in December. I think December second. Oh, oh, you will not be disappointed. These guys kick so yeah, much. Yeah, I've seen them before. They're great. Yeah. I've been. They're great. And um, I love these guys, and I, I cannot recommend them enough. I, I make it a point to never miss the show when they come to Chicago, because every time I go, all they do is kill relentlessly. They're like assassins. These three guys, <laughs> and and it's so musical and it's so so much fun. It's not just a, a shred fest. Like the way they describe their music is is um, psychedelic space folk prog or something like that or or, or world prog how they describe it and it, it is it, it's amazing 
and and I'll, I'll, as as is usually the case with with people who are that talented, they're very down to earth. You know, they know what's going on. They're not they're not full of themselves. And it's it's a pleasure to, for me to just bring them up. Um, please go check them out. Um, they have, like I said, they have four or five studio albums, and several live albums as well. But but um, this one, these two together, the the World War Trio Part One, Two, and Three. That, that lets you know everything that you need to know about them. And then the, the other ones, of course, they just develop that formula further, but it's it's a beautiful thing. Morgable did a bunch of shows with them. Yeah, yeah. So I saw them. Yeah, they played in New York. And uh, I actually I actually tried to sign Consider the Source. Hmm. Well, yeah, that, 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 work harder. No, you know what it is? At, back, they, they really sort of feel they were sort of tied into that jam band scene. That was, I don't know if, is, I don't even know if that's still popular. I assume it is, but uh, yeah, they were. Well, the, their, their touring circuit had a lot of that, right? Yeah. That, that you know, was, the Catskill that was Chill Festival and yeah. all these yeah. other things. So yeah, but, but I mean, these guys are clearly a prog band and um, they, they're just, they just call themselves a jam band because they take extended solos. So yeah. they're actually not just playing the same set list every night exactly the same way. Um, but um, yeah, these guys are, are amazing. I love them, and um, please check them out if you haven't heard them. Nice choice. Yeah. Cool. All right, Stephen. Um, well, my next choice comes from a band who are possibly the biggest news of the past couple of days, but I've gone right to the other end of the spectrum with them. So it's Porcupine Tree, uh, and the song is Yellow Hedgerow Dreamscape. No. which kind of tells you the state of mind that we're talking about here. This is on the Staircase Infinities early compilation. Oh, way back. Yeah, way back. Um, and it's just, I mean, at this stage, there's such a tension in their music at this stage, and it's clearly informed by whatever they were taking that week. I think it's probably the best way of putting it. But I just love, I mean, realistically, it's a whole song where it's just a guitar solo that builds and builds and builds and builds. And the tempo of the song just increases as it heads towards the crescendo. And at no point does, does the solo lose focus. And it's just a phenomenal piece of work. Uh, and Stephen Wilson is, I don't think, really spoken about as a guitarist very much. These days, he often hires other people to do the, the heavy lifting in that department. But the man can play, and he played a lot back in these days. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's that's my number four. Stephen, some of his, uh, some of Wilson's uh, guitar souls on the Black Blackfield first record are really underrated. I mean, very Gilmore esque. Yeah, he's got a great touch and tone and feel, and he seems to manage to kind of fit into different situations while still immediately sounding like him. I really. I'm always impressed with the way that you can kind of morph into these different projects. And with most of them, you still go, ah, it's Stephen Wilson. Yeah. I really like that. Yep. Good choice. George, you're up. My number four is uh, a guy could do no wrong with me for the first seven or eight years of his career. As a 21 year old, he records this record. Yes. Turn forever, Romantic. Hello. Uh, he's another guy like Petrucci that often just comes out blazing all the time. But on the song Duel of the Jester and the Tyrant, he's creeping Love around, kind of slinking, but a lot of nice, pretty bends. Then he makes usage of a tempo change underneath him to deliver the usual L stuff in a fine form on the end of it. But uh, yeah, there was no way I wasn't going to pick something from him. And I go with Duel of the Jester and the Tyrant. Nice. Good choice. Mm -hmm. Without giving too much away, George, uh, I and I'm not saying whether he's going to be in my top five or my honorable mentions. I was I knew I had to pick something from Aldemiola. Man, was that hard trying to pinpoint yeah. <laughs> one solo? I was like, oh my god, you could go with any of them, right? I mean, they're all like amazing. You know, yeah. you know I I, st I shied away from Romantic Warrior because for me it's more of an ensemble. You know, I hear that's the way I hear it. I mean, of course, Al's playing ridiculous stuff on the album, but at the same time, and you know, you got he's playing with Chick. I mean, it's all yes. it's a lot of this as opposed to, you know what I mean? 
where he has yeah. I think he's got more go for the throat solos on like where have I known you before mm-hmm. or no well, I, maybe but you oh, know I, his first like four or five solo albums I mean there's plenty of great stuff I was thinking more about his solo albums really. yeah, yeah. yeah such a great Me player my top 10 legendary player all right Anthony what do you got uh, my number four comes from a guitar player who had just left his previous band uh, two years earlier. Uh, Steve Hackett, Every Day. One of my favorite solos by the man. I mean, it's just very iconic. A lot of Steve Hackett, most Steve Hackett fans know they love this. It's always a staple in his live set. Uh, just just oozing with emotion and oh, like uh <laughs> From I, I think of the uh, the live at Montreux show where they play this and just just that solo is just so effortless and so moving and just the tone. So I'm going with Steve Hackett every day from 1979 off Spectral Morning. Try I was track it was the opener track opening track on the record. Contagious your favorite song too. Um, uh, the track number five. Contagious. Oh favorite yeah. Song. <laughs> I've taken that song for what it's worth over the years, Chuck. <laughs> Just like a goofy little ditty. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, man. In other words, those, those shitty songs we kind of like anyway, right? <laughs> yeah. We all have those. Oh, yeah. All right, Chuck, what do you got next? Oh, man. Well, I'm uh, sticking with uh, Steve Hackett. I'm going to go to the last album that he did with Genesis. Um, all in a Mouse's Night from Wind and Weathering. Ooh. Um, what's that that ending solo, man? Just just killer, man. You know, what's a, you just wish that this guy was able to just be able to bring it out while he was still in the band, but it wasn't meant to be, man. You know, that's one of my favorite solos from Steve. And you know, this sadly was one of the last ones that he did with this band. They didn't even play the song live that much either. So, you know, that's the end of that right there. Steve Hackett, all in the mouse's night, wind and weathering. Cool. Mm-hmm. I still haven't forgiven you for the nursery crime comment the other day, but I'll, I'll, I'll get it. <laughs> oh, man. No, man. Seven Stones is one of my favorite tracks. Uh, I never cared much for it. <laughs> That's just you neither. Me. Really? Cared, oh. no. What's a, and the, I just never liked the, the recording of the album. The album just sounds like like it's recorded beyond a, behind a, a cardboard box or something. It yes. just kills me. I rather prefer to listen to the songs live. Mm-hmm. Uh, for me, I, I truly can say I discovered Genesis mm-hmm. properly when I had an opportunity to hear Steve Hackett solo. Because mm-hmm. that's when I realized, oh, oh, this is what's happening. Because <laughs> right? the mixes are very strange. You know, they, they are, one would think that a, a keyboard player was very heavily invested in the final sounds. <laughs> <laughs> so you know it's 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 to the depth of, of the actual material and um, I, I think um i when i finally got to hear what i was missing i was just so fucking pissed right <laughs> it's like it's it's um i don't know it, it it just seems like such a waste to have this incredibly talented individual but you don't want him to overshadow your pad uh, <laughs> i was like come on man you know Mm-mm-mm. But I'm not gonna go there because <laughs> I, I got a story for you. It's when when I saw when I saw Steve Hackett uh, do the uh, the first Genesis Revisited, which was like 2013, I was pretty hammered, and uh, he had said something, and I said, "Yeah, well, somebody needs to tell Tony Banks that." And, like the crowd just like was like, "This was the Keswick." Everybody went silent. Steve's like, "Oh, he's a good mate." And I was like, "Oh, fuck!" <laughs> <laughs> Heard me. <laughs> <laughs> a good mate. Yeah. Yeah, I bet he is. He could be, but yeah, like you said, no, 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 he doesn't have a bad word to say about anybody. No, no, no. And that's that's my whole point is that you know band dynamics are always problematic. Yep. yep. Even though the people in them are great, you know, it's just it something happens always. I don't know why. These well, for some always... reason, Banks was salty that he did that solo album. I mean, he was salty about oh. it. Yeah, but then they were going to use his music for Trick of the Tail anyway. So. I know. <laughs> right. mm-hmm. Oh, boy. Yep. Uh, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> All right, Eric. What do you got, Eric? Well, for this one, um, I came about his music through his son. Um, and he's been mentioned twice. So I started going to see Dweezil because a friend dragged me to a show. 
and I always felt like I can't listen to Zappa. You know, he's just too clowny, corny, the words. And I went and saw Dweezil and it blew me away. And the fun part of this story is it's probably, you know, it's one of his more known songs. But when I started listening to him, I was playing him in the car all the time. And my daughter would get in the car and say, Dad, play the dental floss song. So <laughs> my, mine is from um, Overnight Sensation, and it's Montana. the guitar solo in Montana. Cool. Mm -hmm. my That's cool. Nice. She doesn't That's like him anymore, but when she was little. <laughs> Uh, hey, it doesn't Dweezil bring it live though, Cammy. Oh, he, he he's does, phenomenal. Man. I I mean, he made me a fan. Mm -hmm. I did not really care for Zap. I mean, I don't think I gave him a huge chance, but I had a buddy and he's like, you have to go. If you're a musician, you got to see this band, you got to see him. And I was absolutely blown away. And I went out and bought a ton of Zappa after that. And I've got, I think I've seen him eight times. I will not miss a Dweezil Zappa show. The, the last um, concert I've been to was Dweezil Zappa um, at the Paramount. Mm -hmm. And I see George's buddies with him. Hi, <laughs> Asher. I thought you said something else. <laughs> that was what we all <laughs> All right, back to Ken. So, Anthony, uh, um, I apologize because I have to uh, correct an error. Uh, you just had you had the right album. You just had the wrong song. Oh, the Angel Clock of Mon. No, I I was thinking oh, Spectral Morning. I was thinking track. Spectral Mornings. The title, the, the, okay. title, the title track. I mean, Steve's my favorite guitar player. I mean, and you know he's this technically accomplished player, but for me, nobody plays with with more emotion. To me, he's like the perfect combination of like emotion and adrenaline. Uh, and I mean, the guy literally, he makes his guitar cry. And <laughs> Spectral Mornings is the perfect example of that. I mean, it just builds and builds and it just has this incredible release. It's just like, it's just this perfect combination of speed, fluidity and passion. Great, great album yep. overall. Every day is a great song. And uh, it's just that, you know, Spectral Mornings is a little better, sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, we're heading in there, that direction again. <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, that's such a, it's such a, you know, this is a great album. You, you know, it's it his is. best album, in my opinion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, a couple, the last couple of tours I've seen him on, he's opened with Spectral Mornings. I, that used to be his closer, if I remember. But yeah. As long as he's got it in the set, right? That's all that matters. Right. Yeah. yeah. All right, for my number five. I had to pick Robert Fripp for one of them. Nice. The question was going to be which one, right? So uh, I ultimately settled on the opening track on Lark's Tongues and Aspic, part one. It's almost like it, it's a solo, but it's like it, it's kind of not a solo because he's like, he gets in, he's doing all this acrobatic stuff. <laughs> it's just so bonkers and just so out there. I love it because, quite frankly, at this point in time, I mean, who was really doing stuff like this? Mm -mm. Rip was just playing this off the wall stuff, that all this dissonant atonal, you know, passages and whatnot, and just brilliant. And he he could speed with the best of them, but uh, and he could also play really softly with a lot of sustain and with a lot of feel. And I think he got like a little bit of everything with every King Crimson album. So, but uh, ultimately I think my favorite from him is Lark, Lark's Tongues and Aspect Part One from the album of the same name. Back to Lewis. Okay. So um, my next pick is a guy who I think is has been very undeservedly um, kind of boxed out of the realm where he truly belongs. Um, I discovered his music at Nearfest, and I've become a, a fan and a friend. I've even had a chance to play a couple of shows with 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 him and his band. And I am talking, of course. There's a there's a guy in New Jersey, I believe, who who puts out his albums. Um, this is a French man, so bonsoir, Christophe Godin, and this is um, Morgable, the band. And my favorite album by them is jazz for the deaf oh beautiful mm -hmm. beautiful and and, and the song i mean there there this is just killer top to bottom but for me 
the song that really just grabbed me and made me understand that this guy was just from a different dimension was the monster within me. Mm -hmm. And then immediately followed up by, by jazz for deaf people. Mm -hmm. Come on. Okay. So I, I'll, I'll just tell a quick story. I, I once went to see him play at a, at some venue. I don't even forget. I forget the name. It was in the North side of Chicago and there were like four or five bands playing that night. And, and that was the entirety of the audience, just the bands and their gear and, you know, and me. And I came to see Morgable and I was just chatting with them and you know, having some fun. And they were, they were billed third. So they, they go on, they absolutely annihilate, which is the only thing they're capable of doing. Because they're funny, they're, they're brilliant, they're incredible. And then uh, when they get off the stage, we're having some beers and, and suddenly the, the next band that was up, they were setting up their shit, but the guitarist was just packing and leaving. <laughs> and, and they're like, what are you doing? And, and, they asked, and the guy said, no, I quit. You can't quit. We have a show. No, no, no. Not only do I quit the shitty band, I quit guitar. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> the guy, wow. the guy was like, fuck this. I'm done. I'm going to sell this, this thing next week and I'm going to move on with my life because this is clearly not my, my jam. Right. Wow. <laughs> and um, this is, this is a, I love this guy. He's a sweetheart and his band in general, even if his drummer is a little nutty and we sometimes fight on Facebook. I, I, I love them to death. <laughs> and um, I, I, I can't recommend it enough for people who don't know them. More mm -hmm. You can just album, see my man. friend, Ken. Mm -hmm. He's got the whole spiel of albums. Mm -hmm. And um, you will not regret buying any of them. They're all fantastic. It, but for me, the... this, was, this, was, this is my, my favorite one. Mm -hmm. They so, are the nicest, the nicest guys. Yes. The yes. nicest band I've ever worked with. And I've worked with some great, I've worked with some shits. And I've worked yes. with a lot of great people, great people. And the, the three guys are mortgable. They're right at the top, you know. Yes, they, very nice they, guys. Anytime they could, they stay here. They're great. They're even my wife Lauren always said what great guests they are, and uh, they held it. They named the song after my cooking. So the, this is good. a little romance <laughs> called called Golden Ribs. That's right. So, yeah, that's right. Yeah, when are you having a barbecue, Ken? I've seen your post. So well, you know, we, we could do it. We could do it in the fall. We could do it. We could do a. Uh, a proxy barbecue, so it's no problem. So for Steve, it might be a little bit of a haul, but oh, uh, I'm I'm free anytime. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, but yeah, those guys, they're they're great. So you know, they ha actually have a new project going on. I don't know if you guys know it. Yeah, uh, they teamed up with Maggie Loyton, who's a great singer, and they have this new band called The Prize, and it's it's vocals. Maggie's the singer. She's a great soulful singer. And she's not like an operatic type, you know, it's not like Epica or anything like that. And uh, it's, it's more of like a hard rock, like straight up hard rock album played by guys who are like these incomparable musicians. So it's, it's cool stuff. So they're, you know, we'll talk to you more. more great though. They, they great guys. The they put the P in power, power trio, big time. Yes. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. Those guys could do anything. Yeah. Yes. They're amazing, man. Mm -hmm. yeah. Everybody, the, the, you know, the, the bass player, he's so, you know, he, Ivan, Even, you know, yeah. when he does, this is the worst bass solo in the world. <laughs> and then he kicks ass anyway, but he's just trying <laughs> the hard to suck, but he's just killing it. <laughs> I mean, come on. These guys are ph phenomenal. Right? They're just, just you know. Pete, do we have time for me to tell you a Morgable story? Go ahead. <laughs> so I had this kind of this dream. I always wanted to have a concert in my backyard with Morgable. And I'd been thinking about it for years because they, you know, pre-COVID, they used to come around, they used to tour pretty frequently. And barbecue is one of my passions. And I had a very, very severe accident on my deck barbecuing in the middle of the winter. I slipped on ice and I tore the, I ruptured the patella tendon in my left knee. Oh. And I was laying in a snowbank on my deck waiting for EMS to come. And of course the police show up and here I am. I'm literally, I'm in a state of shock. I can't move. My leg is going in two different directions that it's not supposed to go. And I'm laying in a snowbank <laughs> and I'm waiting for EMS. And the cop comes walking up the steps of my deck. 
and I and I'm laying there. And I said to him, "Let me ask you a question. <laughs> What's the ordinance if I want to have a band playing in my backyard?" <laughs> you know? And he's, you know, like, "How late can I go? Do I need a permit?" He said, "You know," he said, and he looked at me like I was out of my mind, and I was. <laughs> I was out of my mind. I mean, I literally, I was in, I was in shock, and I and. And he said, eh, you know, curfews at 11, anything before 11. Said, okay. And then two guys showed up with a gurney and they lifted me onto a gurney and they took me down to the hospital and I had reconstructed about a week later, I had reconstructed knee surgery. So anyway, that was my brief morning. Mr. But you still haven't had them play in your backyard. I still haven't. And, <laughs> and we always talk about it. And with the you whole, got that valuable thing, information though, that's all you needed. That now I know, but now I know that if I, if I do it, because uh, I could, I could probably fit a couple hundred people in my backyard, so uh, I figured it'd be a cool thing to do. Yeah, man. So I would do the cooking, and I charge like twenty bucks for a half a rack of ribs. I make a fortune on you guys. Jeez. <laughs> How about we all bring like, uh, like uh, some beer and like a, a side? Mm. And you Already bring it to me. We'll, we'll, yeah. we'll negotiate. <laughs> <laughs> My, my maybe bear makes the best buffalo chicken dip. Yeah, but maybe someday it might happen. I mean, they would love to do it, and I would love to have them do it. Yeah, you know, we talk. I, I, if that happens, I'm making that drive. Oh yeah, that would be crazy. It would be. be and, then, and then what you can do is get on Ken's beautiful sound system, and we can put on an album from 1976. There we from go. The, from the planet of Sun Hill. Oh no, <laughs> yeah. Lord, there we go. <laughs> Very nice. Uh, yeah, yeah. With that, Stephen, please go. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, well, my third choice is, well, he's a guy that's in lots of my kind of more recent favorite acts. Um, he produces lots of things. He's kind of half of a record label, I think, these days as well. Uh, and there are actually two guitarists on this album, so I might be doing John Boys a disservice. But the guitar solo on Black Light Machine from Frost Million Town certainly sounds like John Mitchell to me. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just a phenomenal piece of work. So many different movements, so many different pieces in it. Um, but yeah, it's from the heart and it's emotional. But it's same again, it's just something that touches you as you listen to it, pulls you in, there's a story. Uh, and I just love it. I listened to it again uh, yesterday, and it still has the same effect as the first time that I heard it. And it's, I think this is a really underrated album. I think Million Town is a really fantastic album. But that's kind of the, the long, sprawling epic on, on it that really stands out. Uh, and that's my number three, John Mitchell, Blacklight uh, Machine from Million Town by Frost. Yeah, yeah great John guitarist, man. Mm -hmm. He could play, man. You know what's a, he says that he lists uh, uh, Francis Dunry as a as an influence, but he's far more melodic, far more soulful than anything that uh, Frank um, Dury, Dunry ever did. Mm -hmm. Love the guy. Mm -hmm. I, agree with that. I always thought Mitchell was kind of like he had like the melodic sense of a Gilmore, but much more mm -hmm. technical. I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, got a little more. And, I mean, you can play things that are really progressive, but you can play kind of more pop oriented stuff for you know uh, it covers. A really wide spectrum. He also uh, sings quite guitarist. well. Good yeah, singer. Yeah, he's a, mm -hmm. yeah. And he's a great guy to go out for drinks with. Oh, nice. there you go. He's very discouraging <laughs> about his singing. He, he always, if you ever see them live, or whoever he's with, and he sings, he always tells you he can't sing. And he can sing. Uh, he sings very well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he sings very he well. He always says that, but he's wrong. Steven, some of his Lonely Robot stuff's really good. Yeah, yeah, really good. Uh, he's know. really found a kind of signature sound as he came out of that bites and went into Lonely Robot. Uh, he's one of these guys that you hear anything by him now and you immediately go, oh, that, that's John Mitchell. I, I really, I'm very impressed with it, with the Lonely Robot stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right, George. Well, uh, any discussion of guitar player is always, uh, is always a, a passel of guys who uh bunch of no-hopers with no technique are going to come in and razz on anybody that that does have technique. It's the way of the world, but it's not the worst thing in the world to build up a technique through the years. And, uh, and that's not always about feel. It depends on the context of the work. I mean, sometimes it's okay to show off. And that's the case with this record. 
a band called the Mark Ronnie Project. Oh, Centrifugal Funk is the record. The producer expressly said, don't worry about being tasteful. Come out here and leave people to waste. So there's a song on here called Hey T-Bone. It's kind of a two for one. You get two on this one. Brett Garcid, who used to be in Nelson, does the first solo. He's a, a super legato guy. Like, very mm -hmm. right there with Holdsworth. A little more melodic, less alien than Alan's runs. That solo is incredible. And the second solo is, uh, at this time, a young kid named Sean Lane from the Memphis area. Uh, just he's unusual tone for him on this one. It's a little dirty, a little rough. And he just comes out and annihilates, just burns the ground on this solo. Uh, it's, it's, the, the only feel is not just the typical feel. Sometimes exhilaration is a feel. And being gobsmacked by technique is a feel. So if you like that, hey, T-Bone. Yeah. I saw Brett Garcet play at NAM with TJ Helmer. Oh, yeah, yeah. The two of them. And TJ, I mean, that guy was wild. He, he plays with his guitar vertical. It was very, very peculiar. But anyway, Garcet. He's from the suburbs here, TJ. He's from yeah. Buffalo Grove outside of the city. Gar I don't, what's Garcet doing now, man? He was Sessions in Australia. He don't even, he don't even come over here anymore. Uh, he was a fantastic player. Sean Lane, though, man, what technique that guy had. Oof, scary. Yeah. <laughs> scary, yeah. scary. It's dangerous for the producer to tell him, just go off, because that's what he does. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Those albums he did with Jonas Helborg were fantastic. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hey, Anthony, our center square, you're up. Uh, my number three, we're going back to the UK. Uh 1975, we're, we're going with Camel, Andy Latimer from the uh, Snow Goose, uh, 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 what was it, was it a soundtrack or not a soundtrack, yeah, um, I'm going with the title track, the Snow Goose, which was track six, uh, it's more of an, it's, it's all instrumental album, there's many solos on here that are very enjoyable, but uh, the track, the, the title track, the Snow Goose, has it's an instrumental tune, but it also has that, that Gilmore-esque type tone. I think that's what I love about Latimer. Latimer's the type of guitar player that it kind of scratches that Gilmore riff. It's just that tone, the emotion, uh, it's just fantastic. So I'm going with uh, Cam Camel, Andy Latimer, the Snow Goose. Nice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Love it. There. Mm -hmm. Cool. Chuck. All right. My number three is from the Tony Williams Lifetime Band. Um, what's for that? It's um, Alan Holdsworth's Fred off of Believe It. Oh, that's um, a good one. You know, what's for that? You, know, you could pick any song from the from that album in which he solos, but it's Fred that he just absolutely smokes on. You know, that Fred actually, what's for that, hinted towards the future, Alan Holdsworth, but then it still was at that grittiest grittiness of what he had prior to and at that time. Um, what's up? my number three is Fred with um, Alan Holdsworth. Just killer, killer solo, man. Mm -mm -mm. Love it. Two thumbs up. Great choice. Mm -hmm. All right, Eric. So this solo, um, it's a band I haven't mentioned, but they're a very popular band um, on this channel. And this is before I wouldn't have known what Prague was if somebody told me it was Prague. Um, I just remember hearing this on the radio and I was just starting to play guitar at this time. And obviously I think we all, we'd all agree a great solo and a crap song, who cares, right? But this, this song and this solo have always hit me. It's uh, Alex Lifeson from Rush and it's Free Will. Oh yeah. I just, the whole song to me, just even in the studio, it crushes and that bass and drum that starts before Alex kicks in. And to me, it just, I think it, it's life's in just kind of what you guys were saying about some other players. It's almost like someone just said, just play Alex. Like he didn't have any thought in his head and he just ripped it. And to me, it's my favorite, it's my favorite solo in the Rush catalog from Alex. He's had some great ones, man. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. big time. Great that's choice. A, that's a great choice. Yeah. All right, Ken. Back to you. All right. So for my third choice to uh, borrow from the Good Rats, we're taking it to Detroit. 
And uh, for my number three pick, I picked Eddie Hazel's solo. Maggot yes. brain. Mm-hmm. Maggot brain. Mm-hmm. Well, you could also so, went with Super Stupid too. <laughs> oh, I mean Eddie. Eddie, <laughs> he was he was ridiculous. Mm-hmm. And it's the opening track, the title track from from the album. And it's, it was their third album. And all it is, is this 10 minute uh, guitar solo. And it's nothing but a guitar solo. It, it's just like pure LSD psychedelic madness. It, it's got like a kraut rock vibe to it. it. If this was something that was on some brain, you know, something that came out on the brain label, you wouldn't even think twice about it. it starts out slowly, starts out with typical funkadelic weirdness. But then it's just and it just gradually just erupts and he plays with just fire and and emotion, just like I was talking about. So mm-hmm. great, great record. You know, Love it. Yeah. Yep. I recommend it. And, and I, you know, yeah, anything with Eddie Hazel is for me is a winner. Mm-hmm. Great player. Yep. Great Cheers. album. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. All right. My number three, uh, like Eric, I'm going to go to the Great White North here. I, I was not. I was originally not going to include any lifes and solos, and then I said, "Ah, there's no way I can't include him in my top five because he was one of the best at creating memorable solos within these great songs." And I had to go with La Villa Strangiato, but specifically from Exit Stage yes. Left, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. it kills the, the mm-hmm. studio version. Is great, yes. it's way better, mm-hmm. and I just love the way he just. <laughs> builds and builds in that song it's so dramatic and just so absolutely pulverizing and beautiful all at the same time i mean this guy just says so much with his solos and i love that and uh yeah la villa strangiato all instrumental all great i love the, the i love the bur- the electric burst at the beginning of the song on the live album which you get on classical guitar on the studio version so it's a uh, kind of cool differences i think between the live and the studio on here but uh, that's my number three Back you know, to that, was the first, that was the first Rush album I ever bought. Mm-hmm. That's, why, that, that's why I have such an affinity for that specific album. You know, it, it's, probably it's, these versions of these songs, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cool. All right, Lewis. All right. So this guy has already been mentioned, <laughs> but I want to mention him in the context of his own compositions and not as a hired gun by Stephen Wilson, which is, you know, like what everybody raves about. Mm-hmm. I am, of course, of Guthrie Coven, who is uh, just a, an insanely brilliant guitarist. And um, for my choice, I am picking the title track of the Aristocrats' Culture Clash. Great. This, I mean, it's, it's, it's just such a, everything this guy does is, is just so unusual, you know? Like, if you really listen to it, you know, he, he's doing these, these weird, like, um, it's like a pentatonic thing, but it's not your typical blues pentatonic. It's like a one flat, two, four, six, seven, and start again. But then he he does these groups of five notes, but then he, he goes up and down in fours, so there's like rhythmic displacement. So then the entire thing just gets very confusing. And that's exactly what you want to represent for culture clash, right? We're kind of talking about the same thing, but not exactly that. I mean, it, it just works at every level that he does, you know? And um, every time I've seen them live, he he seems to be you know allergic to fucking up. I don't know how he does it, <laughs> but he just doesn't, you know. And, and you know, considering the, the the number of notes per second that he delivers in some of these runs, it's absolutely stunning. But he there's a musicality to everything, which is what I what I care about. I want solos that tell me a story that serve a song. I don't want the song that was written as a prop for the fucking solo, right? I don't care about that. <laughs> but this guy is a, is a genius, in my opinion. And I, I think he deserves a mention in his own right, because, yeah, he was great with Stephen Wilson, but, you know, Stephen Wilson was lucky to have him. So so this is this guy is is, um, is a one of a kind. Yeah. And, of course, he's got Marco Miniman on drums mm-hmm. and Brian Beller on bass, right? So this is... Okay. Another, it is, it's impossible to get a better trio, right? Than that. The and, world's and, most and, dangerous and, band, right? Yeah, and 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 they have a very democratic way of writing. Like each member writes a third of the record. They're all composers, and then they just divvy it up, and it, it's a beautiful thing. So, for people who are not familiar with the Aristocrats, please check them out. Their oh, records are are available readily, and um, they will change your life for the better. I think. 
Mm-hmm. Guthrie Govan. Great choice. Great yep. choice. Mm-hmm. Stephen, back to you. Well, I'm just going to say it with a Scottish twang then and say Guthrie Govan. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> but my choice is where he's a hired hand, to be fair. Um, so, yeah, I'm going Wilson. I'm yeah. going uh, Regret number nine. It's just a fantastic. Yes, it just work. kills me every time, man. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's just got so much heart about it. And um, there's a great YouTube clip where they're recording it, and he's just you get to watch him up close playing the solo, and he does it in one take. And I mean, I love watching him play because he always gets to the end, and the look on his face is almost apologetic. It's almost. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where it comes from, you know? And, I mean, I actually believe it or not, I saw him first. The first time I was aware of Guthrie Govan, he was playing with one of Ken's favourite bands because he was playing with Asia at the time. <laughs> I mean... Say no more, really, say no more. Absolutely. I think that was the Aura album, which is my favourite Asia album because his playing on that is out of this world. He raises what is a a good progressive EOR album and something else entirely. But watching him live, and I, I mean, I was standing there kind of going, who is this guy? And he looks, and I, I hope if he ever was to see this, he doesn't mind me saying it, he looks remarkably uncomfortable. <laughs> you know, he, he just oh, yes. doesn't look all that kind of natural or the sounds that he creates are out of this world. And this was really difficult putting these lists together. And I didn't really pick an order, but my top two I could have filled all of my five choices with picks just from them. And Guthrie Govan is one of those guitarists where I could have easily picked five from different spectrums of these, you know, catalog solo stuff, Aristocats. Oh, amazing. Absolutely fantastic. Good. Yep. Absolutely. Cool. All right, George. This one, sometimes the background story kind of accentuates the solo. This is a, uh, this one's pretty obscure. A uh, band called Tri Offensive from Japan. The guitar player is named Yuya Komaguchi, 20 years old. And it's a fantastic solo, like a Greg Howe, in the Greg Howe realm, but for me, a lot tastier, more memorable. The thing that adds into it is that knowing it's their debut and like this is the it's the first song on the album, so knowing that this is the first solo the guy ever put down, I think that just the way that you know you know about that and how it establishes them, I think that adds in. So for me, I would say Fate of the Azure, Try Offensive. Cool title. You have to look that up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I'll put writing down. <laughs> <laughs> All right, back to our center square. Uh, my number two, we're going back to the Great White North, and Cammy had the right album, but the wrong song. I'm going with Rush, Jacob's Ladder from Permanent Waves from 1980. My all-time favorite Alex Lifeson guitar, guitar song, just fantastic, emotional, atmospheric, nothing to say more, fantastic guitar, guitar solo. So I'm going with Jacob's Ladder, Rush, Permanent Waves, 1980. It's a great reissue right there. Mm-hmm. Yep. Got that too. Oh, reissue. yeah, that live. Uh, that, those damn live records, Pete. Ugh. <laughs> I don't buy them for the mixes. I buy them for the live records. All right. They, they know how to get us, right? The damn <laughs> curse. <laughs> the curse is real, folks. <laughs> it is. Uh, Chuck, here we go. All right. My number two yeah, has been mentioned already. Um, going to 1976, um, UK, Moon Madness. Uh, Andrew Latimer, Lunar Sea. Uh-huh. If you ever want to hear how great this guy is, man, and how fiery he can be, uh, just listen to that ending solo, man. From what's a, from that time that he he just smokes on this song. The the, te- the 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 group actually sounds like they're actually on fire during this time, and it's Lunar Sea, man. That's that's my favorite solo uh, from um, Andrew Latimer with the group Camel. Mm-hmm. One of my favorite Camel songs too. Oh, yep. love it, man! Mm-hmm. Great tune. Oh, the mm-hmm. the intro to that song is really spooky. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the ending, <laughs> yeah, good stuff. All right, Eric, back to you. 
All right, I got to put on my Captain Obvious shirt for my last two, but this one he hasn't been mentioned. Um, David Gilmore. Oh. And I got to go with Dogs. No, and it, no. It's got, I believe, three different solos in there. Mm -hmm. So I'll apologize up front, but I can't have a guitar solo list without David Gilmore on it. Um, but that's, even with all the great solos he has, that is still my favorite solo. I know mm -hmm. Comfortably Numb and everything else in the books, but I love dogs. No need to apologize for that. No, I know. <laughs> yeah. you know, a big muff, a phaser, and a memory man, they work, dude. Yep, they go to work. Especially if your name is David Gilmore. <laughs> they do. Yeah. Keep it simple. All right, oh, Ken, yeah. back to you. There, there, there are three songs which I, I didn't mention because for me, they were kind of like the low-hanging low fruit. And I figured eventually they would get to be somebody's number one. Comfortably Numb, of course, was, you know, one of the one of the ones I, I, I went out of my way to avoid. So uh, I'm my number two, I'm going to dig very, very deep. And we're going to Germany in 1971. Ashra Temple. Temple. Mm -hmm. First album from Ashra Temple. I'll give it a little flex here. Give it an original, original copy. Beautiful original copy. So Ashra Temple was Manuel Gotching on guitar. Klaus Scholz at the time. He was the drummer and Hartman Enk was the bass player. Mm -hmm. And the album is just two sidelong tracks. And Amboss is the first track, uh, makes up side one. And it's just like this heavily drugged out lo-fi masterpiece where uh, Schultz and Enk kind of create this rhythmic pattern. And they just kind of get out of the way for gotching to just freak out for 19 minutes and it's Hendrix though. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. if you're not stoned before you, you listen to this, you will be by the time this is over. <laughs> and it, I mean, it's just, I, to, this is, this album is in my all time top 10. So when, and as I've said in the past, I have a hundred albums in my top 10, but this is, you know, this is right up there. This is to me as a masterpiece. First time I bought it, I was about 17 years old. It was on my first stereo. And uh, I didn't realize that I had been playing some 45s and I actually listened to it at 45. I couldn't believe the sides were so short. But I mean, my God, I've never heard anybody play so fast in my life. I got to tell you, this album, this album smokes. It's at, at 33 and a third, it's amazing. At 45, it's life changing. <laughs> uh, and it, it and and the thing with Ashra Temple is they man, they, they kept changing the next album Schwingungen wasn't nearly as good it was a different lineup and then Schultz came back and they did join in and that was kind of that kind of went back to this and then they hooked up with Timothy Leary and they got crazier Ooh. and then eventually Gotching fired everybody and he just started putting out these albums by himself under the name of Ashra and all, all good, all good stuff. But this is the one, Ash, the first Ashra temple. It's, it's a masterpiece. It really is. And for guitar, you can't beat it. Unlike a lot of their peers, you know, a lot of their peers, um, we always talk about can, you know, we always talk about Faust, you know, what's the, well, they had that same, that sort what edginess of the German scene, but they what to just think about the German scene or Robin Trar uh, mixed with Krautrock. And that's what you have right there, man. Yeah. Great band. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Amazing. Amazing record. Cool. All right. Uh, my number two, man, if we had done this a couple of weeks ago, I don't think this would have been in my top five. But ever since uh, I've been listening to this live album again, for the first time in a while, uh, I've grown a different appreciation for not only this guy, he's amazing. I always thought he was amazing, but man, on this live album, he just absolutely kills. Guy's name is Bill Nelson, uh, Bebop Deluxe Live in the Air Age, Adventures in a Yorkshire Landscape. Oh, killer, killer. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, you talk, you know, Ken was talking about earlier how some of the great solos have to have that emotional level to it. 
this song, there's that emotional impact mixed with amazing technique. And it's just, he's so fluid and all the notes are so tasteful and so melodic and so perfect. And it just, the solo just takes you on this long ride that you never want to end. And he had this way of throwing those great solos in a lot of their songs, no matter what kind of style the album is, because all the Bebop Deluxe albums are all really different from each other. But man, his playing was always great, no matter what they were doing. And Adventures in New Yorkshire Landscape, it's great on the studio album too, but on this, it just takes it to a new level. So good. Bill Nelson, one of the greatest guitar players that half the year actually probably three quarters of the universe has never heard of before. So I, if you ever my favorite from that one is Sister Seagull. Oh, that's oh, fantastic too. too. Yeah. It's that's just great. so so insanely brilliant, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not it's 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 uh he's not he's not really doing anything crazy, but he does it so well. So well, yeah, right? so good. And I will say for those folks who have, I've already said this on my review of this, but if you haven't gotten this yet and yeah. it's worth it's it a must. Mm -hmm. just for the Hammersmith Odeon concert mm -hmm. from 77, it's got mm -hmm. the full show here on two discs. Oh, amazing. I mean, the regular live in the air is great too. It's amazing. But man, with that bonus live show, no brainer, no brainer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That would have made is great too. If I wasn't doing live, if I, I made a point not to do live, that would have made my top five. It's so good. It's a must own album. Yeah. And it, what's a, if you listen to the studio version of that track and so it's totally different from from the live version. The live version is like um is actually both are brilliant. Yeah. But but live that song just took on another whole level of brilliance. The great Bill Nelson, man. Yeah. Yes. Needy. All right, back he to could, Lewis. He could have been somebody. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> <laughs> you could have been a contender <laughs> well my my last one for my number one this is truly my number one um i have been fortunate in my life to meet some incredible musicians and sometimes even work with them and um but this guy out of all the people i've met i can i can honestly say his brain is just wired different there is just something about this guy that he just thinks about stuff in ways that I cannot even begin to comprehend, but which for him are intuitive. And we're analyzing the same thing, the same piece of music. Uh, I got a chance to play a show with him um, at Proctoberfest. It was a Keith Emerson tribute after Keith had passed. And he picked out the whole set list, starting with songs from the nice. And then he picked out a whole bunch of obscure EOP songs did a couple of other ones. Uh, Jonathan Shang played drums. Um, there, were, there were several people there. And uh, of course, I'm talking about Mike Keneally. Mike Keneally is, is, is just a one of a kind, right? Great keyboard, yes. great guitars. He played the trilogy. <laughs> and the, and the, the guy who was playing keyboards was just fascinated by how he chose to finger it. Because <laughs> from, from, from the perspective of a pianist, it made no sense. But he just did it intuitively and effortlessly. And it was it was an, an incredible experience for me to share the stage with this guy. I love him to death. Uh, I, I've, I've hung out with him many times. Whether you see him with Death Clock or you see him with Joe Satriani and dueling with Joe Satriani on stage. Um, I look forward to always seeing his band whenever I have an opportunity. But now I think he's playing with Devin Townsend mm -hmm. and with a Zappa band. And doing yeah, he did Zappa band this summer. Yeah. So I... Um, for 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 my choice today and it's just because it's it's a it's a song that has lived in my head for a while and i just absolutely love it i am going with scamba 2 nice mm -hmm. and the track is in the trees i challenge you to to break down that song and and, and just 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 study it and tell me what the fuck he's doing <laughs> It is, it is. I mean, I can tell you, it's brilliant. I can tell you, I can give you lots of positive adjectives, but I, I still have a lot of trouble comprehending his brain. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the many reasons why I admire Mike Keneally so much. And um, I think that he's also usually underrated as a guitarist for some reason, but he, you know, he's incredible. Absolutely incredible. So my number one, without any doubt, Mike Keneally, Scamble 2, 
the track is in the trees and it comes in a nice package if you want to go to his earwax um, site you know <laughs> it's a very nice it's a very nice package and um, the booklets are, are I mean I don't know how to describe just from the illustrations you know there's a lot of cool shit going down right and um, and this takes you on a trip man and this is the man himself Mike Lee, numero uno Learned a lot from his former boss, I'll tell you that much. And again, it's a good name. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, Stephen, you're number one. Well, I'm probably going to be, my turn to be Captain Obvious. Um, I have changed which song to choose from this guitarist four times today, five times today, and literally minutes before I sat down to come and talk about this with y'all. I stood in front of my CDs and closed my eyes and the title track to Season's End is yeah, what mm -hmm. came into my head because that to me is a guitar solo that is just ripped straight out of that man's soul. Mm -hmm. it, is, it drips with emotion and it takes you on a journey. You close your eyes, you're part of the song and when it begins to fade out and later again he comes back with something else, it's just technically fantastic, emotionally superb. And that's the side, I mean, yeah, technique. I love technique, but especially when you see some of these songs, you know, live and they, they touch you, really touch you. That's a song that touches me. Um, so yeah, I could have chosen a variety of songs from Steve Rothery, but that was the one that when it came down to it has really hit me deep. So yeah, the title track to Season's End, Rebellion, Steve Rothery is my number one. I love it. And by the way, I, I think that Steve Rothery has got great technique. Mm -hmm. yeah. He plays with oh, a lot yeah. of game. Mm -hmm. and yeah. He's very quiet and very articulate. He, he's a brilliant guitarist. Mm -hmm. He's I mean, perfect yeah. for that band. He's not a shred, shred guy, but, thank but goodness. who gives a fuck? The guy thank, is thank brilliant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not trying to diminish his, his uh, ability in any shape or form. Yeah, yeah. But I think one of his key strengths is really understanding what a song needs he really he's, he's happy to kind of you know be mellow and subdued while still being utterly phenomenal that to me sums up the best era, the best point about that band is that individually they're, they're phenomenal players only every now and again do they really feel the need to, to kind of tell you that you know and I mean, I, I dissed them last week. I don't stand by that. But, <laughs> you know, they, they can't get it right all the time. But when they do, outstandingly good. And for me, Rodri is just off the charts. On yes, yes. Yep. The whole album. I mean, I could have chosen Easter. There's, there's two off the one album. But, yeah. yeah, the title track I absolutely adore. So that's my number one. Great choice. Good, good choice. Mm -hmm. All right, George, you're number one. Uh, it's kind of a half cheat because he's on that MVP album I mentioned, but I, I couldn't leave out the solo from this album, Sean Lane, Power of Pretend. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a soft song, uh, very symphonic, a song called Gray Pianos Flying. It's oh, only, oh, so beautiful. Three minutes and nine seconds, it's sheer beauty. The intonation, he's creep. first 90% of it, he's just kind of creeping around, giving you the feels. You get crescendos on that end of that better than uh i mean you can't really do a better crescendo than that so i go a great piano is fine brilliant stuff mm -hmm. cool all right anthony you're number one uh my number one goes back to the uk um one of the most iconic guitar souls in the prog community of all time who cares first of ah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. I got you. You're so excited to show that. Come on, Mindy. First birth of fifth. Uh, Hackett's all time iconic solo. It's gorgeous. It's beautiful. You know, first of fifth is a track that starts out with, you know, the, the, the vocal arrangements of Peter. Then it goes into the flute solo. Then that bozo on the keyboards. And then all of a sudden, bam, comes the our iconic guitar solo of all time from Steve Hackett. 1973, birth of fifth, baby. Yeah. <laughs> that, that was one of them. That was one of the ones I said was like, you know, 
The holy grail. The obvious ones. Okay. Okay. Can I can I show off? I have to show off. Okay. Because I'm going to sh show you guys something and show the world something that shouldn't even exist. Okay. Let me see if I can get it up to the camera. And what this is. Okay. What this is, Classic Records, Michael Hobson uh, had uh, Classic Records, and he did reissue, many reissues, but he did the Gabriel era Genesis albums. And the Classic Records versions of those albums are the best, best sounding versions of, of, uh, of all of those classic albums. What this is, is an edition of 20. These are test pressings. He cut the album at 45 RPM. Never went into production. There's only 20 of these. This is number nine. It's selling in by the pound, taken from the original master tapes, cut at 45. Uh, a good friend of mine gifted this to me. He wanted it at auction. And I've never taken it out of the shrink wrap because I'm absolutely terrified of how great it might sound. <laughs> the... The regular classic records version of Selling England, I highly recommend it. It's fantastic. And I can only imagine what it's going to sound like. One day I'll crack it open. I'll, I'll get I'll get very stoned and I'll, I'll put it on the turntable and I'll probably scratch the shit out of it. <laughs> Break the cover. But anyway, but this is you'll get barbecue is, sauce on it. Something like that, yeah. But this is but this is like the whole this is like the holy grail. This is this is made of this is pressed on unobtainium. And uh, so I never get to show it off, and I got to show it. Thank you. Cool. I'll, I'll be quiet. <laughs> That's a nice little treasure there waiting to be opened yeah. someday. Someday. So it's only been sitting here for five years. <clears throat> so before we go on to Chuck, I'm, I'm amazed that Anthony did not pick a Steve Hillage guitar solo. Oh. He's in my horrible mention. Okay. I was okay. going to say, right. I was shocked completely. Uh, he had to pick, he had to pick Firth of Fifth. I, I know that. Hey, come on, Steve. And then I thought, I no, he's not going to pick two Hackett's. I'm like, he's got it. Hillage has got to be number one. That's what I was thinking. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> yeah. Give me for yeah. a loop, Anthony. I'm telling you. All right, Chuck. You're number All one. Right. All right. My, my, what's up? My number one. Uh, what's up? That, um, what's up? Well, it could, could be obvious to those who have been listening to uh, what's up, me ranting and raving about him for the last couple of weeks. And so it's um, obviously Bill Nelson. Um, going to um, to the band um, Bebop Deluxe's first album, Axe Victim. Um, I didn't pick Adventures. I picked No Trains to Heaven. You know, this guy knows how to freaking rock, man. You know, what's that? Um, you know, he just absolutely smokes on this song. Man, just, you know, you know, like I said, man, we can uh, talk about him and so, but until you hear this guy, you know, you just never realize how great of a guitarist man really is, man. And my once again, my number one pick is No Trains to Heaven, Bill Nelson, Axe Victim, Bebop Deluxe, 1975. Mm -hmm. Yep. Nice. Look at that guitar, man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he does most of that stuff on the uh on like the hollow body guitar, which is crazy, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Amazing stuff. All right, Eric, you're number one. Well, my favorites have been chosen. So that one's out the window. I had plenty <laughs> for this guy, and then this one is out the window. <laughs> but there's plenty more so i'm gonna go with something from the lamb oh no mm -hmm. and i'm gonna go with fly on a windshield nice yes. beautiful mm -hmm. you the man and, and again i just think it's between the backing um you just have that haunting mellotron and then he throws that slide over the top of it and the band kind of rips in behind him um and it's it's just <clears> a, it's a it's a haunting melody and and the way he plays over the top of that it's just there's a lot of power to that song when phil kicks in as well so that's my number one great choice yeah great choice got a lot of love for hackett tonight we do mm -hmm. he know. is the man great. <laughs> right you know and you think he's, he's so tasteful yeah mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. yep he's also a gentleman he's, he's such a such a such a sweet guy you know, yeah, it's good to. Yeah. And, and a lot of a lot of his temperament comes across when he plays. Yep, you know? I agree. So he just wins you over because this is you're just hearing him. You know, it's it's a beautiful thing. Yep, yep. Yeah. All right, Ken, you're number one. 
All right. And again, you know, this is number one because it's just because it's number one. It's not necessarily the best, but it's it's a great one. It's John Etheridge, Soft Machine mm. from Soft's Tale of Talisman. Oh and, yeah. You know, I mean, I mean, I could have gone with the other guitar player from from Soft Machine. Uh, you know, I could have picked a track. <laughs> I could have picked a track from Bundles that would have you know would have been fine. But the thing about like the thing about John Etheridge is that when Ratlitz stole all the guys from Nucleus, you know, he put and he put Holdsworth in, it changed the sound of the band. Yes. When Etheridge replaced Holdsworth, it made them like a guitar driven band. And his playing on on the, this album and this track is just insane. I mean, it's just his fingers are just flying. It's just nonstop. And and he's just totally underrated, I, I think. Uh, I mean, if if you saw him when they toured, he could play all the Holdsworth stuff. He's got a different technique. He's not a legato player. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But man, he just he could cover all those parts effortlessly. Um, I, I think, uh, yeah, Teletalison. I mean, it's brilliant too. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so is uh, Song of Aeolus. That's a really good yeah, one too. Of, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's a lot of great. There's a lot of great tracks on this. So you picked the wrong one. Is basically what I'm telling you. No, not really. I don't. <laughs> no, there you I, go again. I don't, I don't, I don't, Anthony, one thing you know about me, I don't pick the wrong tracks. <laughs> um, I know you're never wrong. That's that's just a given. You should know that, buddy. So. Um, well, Ken was very kind, so he went with that as his number one because I'm going to go with the other guy for my number one. So I'm going to go with Hazard Profile from Bundles, oh, Alan Holdsworth. Uh, you know, it, it's one thing, you know, you start off the, this album with this five-part epic and Holdsworth solos on like what, the first like four or five minutes of the first part of this long track. Uh, I've gone on record before as saying how much I love Holdsworth, but I think I like his soloing better when he appears on other people's albums. Not that yeah. his albums don't contain mind-blowing stuff, but I, I've always gotten a little more jack from listening to him in Soft Machine or Gong or UK or Tony Williams' Lifetime. And he just seems, you know, Bill Bruford, I don't know what it is, but when Holdsworth plays on other people's albums, he just goes totally volcanic. And, you know, I think more of the, the more restrained, tasty stuff is safe for his solo albums. Also, he's got plenty of, you know, mind-blowing solos on his solo stuff. But I think that, uh, for me, my favorite Prager Fusion solo of all time is on Hazard Profile. Just amazing. And mm -hmm. if you catch the light, there's a video on YouTube of a live, I think, from them playing in Sweden, which is even more mind-blowing than what's here on the yes. street. But, uh, but, yeah, Alan Holdsworth, Utter genius. That's my number one. Nice. You know, I always said he's the ultimate side man. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, honestly, I mean, in my opinion, I'll get killed, killed for saying this. I don't think he could write a song for shit. He's an <laughs> unbelievable soloist. I mean, for me, it's all about, you know, for Holdsworth, it's all about the solo. And you think about all the bands he was in, UK, right? Soft Machine, Tempest. John Luponti. Nucleus, yeah, Ponti. Yeah. Ponti. Man, <laughs> He's an incredible, incredible. And those are the albums that come to mind. Not, you know, 16, uh, what is it, 16 Meditane or, you know, yeah. you know, IOU. I mean, of course, there, there was a great solos, but as a side man, he plugs in and he just, he just, yep. he just blazes. Yeah, yeah. Yep. absolutely. Anybody got any honorable mentions? Let's go around the Yeah, okay. Lewis, the two. Okay. What do you got? Um, the first one is um, is is a guy who doesn't normally get mentioned as a, as a, as, a, as an amazing guitarist, but I think he is. He has a very unique style of playing. I'm talking about Brett Hind from Mastodon. Oh man, he's and awesome. the track in particular mm -hmm. is "The Last Baron" from Crack yeah. the Sky, mm -hmm. which I also think is their best album to date. Yep. Although the new one, which I just got, I've been living with for the last day and a half, is quite quite good but it's mm -hmm. no crack to sky. Nope. And the other one that I had um, who's been mentioned already twice, but I think that he is so good and so underrated that he deserves a mention in the context of Jonas Helborg. Mm -hmm. Of course, Sean Lane. Mm -hmm. I, I was lucky that I was able to see him play live 
um, shortly before he died. Mm, wow. And there was a lot of, um, I mean, I, I watched him through the 90s, but he played at a place in Baltimore called Cafe Tattoo in 98. I saw that and then other other shows. But um, the last time I saw him, it was um, it was it was really painful to watch him because he was really just letting go. He, he had ballooned to an incredible size. He needed he, he needed a, a harness to sit so he could activate his delay pedals and things. And um, there was a sense of a reinterpretation of some of the old stuff from whatever was going on in his mind at the time that was just really, really moving. And I think um, people owe it to themselves to, to revisit this guy because he was a very complex individual. And, mm -hmm. and I think that the only critique I can offer to him is that he knew that people liked him to shred. And he would just play to the gallery, but, but it just because it was so effortless for him. He, he was actually a very nuanced musician in many ways. Mm -hmm. And um, if you just want to hear an example of just mind face melting shred, you can just go to the album Personae yeah. yep. and just the opening track, right? Time is the enemy. Mm -hmm. But what I would recommend right. people do is take a little extra of their time and get their hands on what I, is, for me, is my favorite album that he did with Helborg and Sype, which is Temporal Analogs of Paradise. Mm -hmm. It's an album that has just two basic tracks, Act One and Act Two, and it, it this this will showcase not only brilliance in the guitar but brilliance in the bass, brilliance in the drums. It, it this is truly a tour de force. Yep. And I know that it, it exists in multiple covers and things, but um, Jeff Lane, I mean Je Sean Lane, was a was a guy who I think was the goat of his day, but nobody knew. Mm -hmm. And um, it's too bad, really, because whatever haunted him eventually took him down. Mm -hmm. I, I think that, that, that people owe it to themselves to just let him live through his music and just, just, just hang with him and just, just, just give him your time. You know, just let him, let him play for you. It, it's an incredible experience. There, there's, there's way too many records. I can't tell you to go buy them all because that's, that's for people who have a music junkie habit. But, <laughs> but these two records, you, you really can't go wrong. You know, and I think um, repeated listens will be um, very rewarding. Yeah. Sean Great Lane. player. Great player. They, we, we didn't have him long enough. I mean, that's the no. thing. Yeah. I mean, he started as a, as a kid with Black Oak, Arkansas, if I yeah, remember correctly. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, mm -hmm. he just moved around. But but he, he was just a, a magician with a guitar. He played those French Vigier guitars at the end. You know, the same mm -hmm. ones that, that Christophe plays. And um, it was it was really heartbreaking to watch him, you know, but also beautiful. Yep. Nice. So I would just say, you know, check it out. Sean Lane. Cool. Steven, you got any honorables? Yeah, I'm, I mean, I played a dangerous game in the hope that, you know, uh, Fuck the Fifth would come up, uh, the hope that Lavella Strangiato would come up. So they weren't in my list for, for that reason. How obviously deserves to be on most of these lists, but I played that game as well. The two that I have kind of put to the side to think, well, do you know what? We might do a part two of this, so let's not name too many. <laughs> is Sons of Apollo, Bumblefoot, um, Gods of the Sun. That's just incredible playing on that. Really like that. And the other one, I suppose, is more a band that are not really known for the solos, um, which is um, Gary Green. Gentle Giant, yes, nice. it's all being, yeah, on mm -hmm. reflection. Mm -hmm. I just that, that's such a fantastic solo. He kind of mimics everything that's happened in the song, and the timing of every note that he plays is just so important. And I mean, everything that's rhythmical about that band, because everything is rhythmical about that band. If you want to go and kind of explore it a little bit, there are some BBC sessions or live shows uh, on YouTube, and, and that really brings into you know focus just how tight they had to be but also how much scope there was to play about at the same time so yeah that's that's my honorable mentions mm -hmm. cool george got any yeah uh, a redemption song called slouching towards Bethlehem." the guitar player is uh simone milleroni he's like one of the hot guys around right now 
I would say that one. Um, uh, Dixie Dregs, The Great Spectacular, mm -hmm. one of the best Steve Morris solos. Mm -hmm. A Watchtower song called Mayday in Kiev, Ranjar Zambek, another one of these oh, guys yeah. just thinks about it differently. Double and triple tracking phrases that come in and out of each other. It's really, really good. And uh, Eric mentioned it in passing, but Drive Home from the Stephen Wilson album, just one of the great builder up solos yep. from Guthrie. So yep. that'd be about it. Cool. Anthony. I got I got three here. Uh, Uncle Frank, Willie the Pimp. Mm -hmm. David Gilmore, Raise My Rent. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Steve Hillage, Afterglade from 1975. Absolutely mm -hmm. cosmic. Mm -hmm. Like right. three nice picks, man. I like them, man. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. Good Thanks, stuff. Brother. <laughs> oh, man. What do you got, Chuck? Oh. All right. Well, I got quite a few, and so I'm going to try to make it very quick. Um, group therapy, um, Steve Hackett from the um, Highly Strung. You know, what's a you, killer, killer solo on there uh, all throughout. And so just back and forth with him and Nick Magnus. Uh, Magnus. Um, and then you have um, in, every, uh, in Every Dream, Homes of Heartache from Phil Manzanera, Roxy Music um, from the For Your Pleasure album. Um, then you have um, the live version of Yours Is No Disgrace from Yes Song, Steve Howe. You know, and I had to throw this in here. So forgive me for this, guys. But Child in Time, Richie Blackmore, Made in Japan, Deep um, Purple. And then I have two from the Great North. Um, Lily from Max Webster. Um, Kim Mitchell, another great guitarist that many yes. here don't know anything about. And so he's just as good as anybody that you mentioned on this list over here. Great guitarist, Kim Mitchell. And my last one is um, Cygnus X1, uh, Farewell from Kings, uh, Alex Lifeson. Um, what's a just my favorite song from Rush and my favorite Rush album? Love that album. Those are my picks. Cool, Eric. All right, I just want to reiterate what Chuck said. Kim Mitchell is fantastic. Go mm -hmm. listen to him, whether it's Max Webster or even his solo stuff. And like Lewis said, uh, with Guthrie, go get some Aristocrats, mm -hmm. great band. And the only one I have that hasn't been mentioned is I love this live album by Saga in Transit oh, mm -hmm. in Crichton Christian. Humble mm -hmm. Stance but there's a number of solos on that record mm -hmm. and he I think he is very underrated as a guitar player. Yep. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a great choice. Yep. Mm -hmm. He's great on that album. Yes. He really I love is. that album. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Anthony, we just had like a solar flare in the center square. <laughs> Again. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ken, I know you, you probably got a few, right? Yeah, I got a few. So, yeah, and, and stories. <laughs> so the two low-hanging fruit that didn't get mentioned surprised me. Starless, Robert Frick. Uh, uh, yeah. Perhaps his, maybe his best solo, maybe. Mm -hmm. But certainly a great one, right? Fracture. Yep. <clears throat> but, you, but you picked the wrong song again. No, I don't think so. I don't think, <laughs> I think you get much better than Starless. Uh, uh, I like Fallen Angel. Yeah, but we're talking about solos. And for me, it's Starless. Yeah. Comfortably numb. You know, I mean, it's one of the iconic solos. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe not their best album, but certainly one of Gilmore's best solos. Al Damiola from Elegant Gypsy, Race with the Devil on Spanish okay. Highway. Oh, or as so one good. guy yelled out at, at, when I saw Al, Race with the Spanish Devil. Wow. <laughs> Al, Al, Al laughed and said, ah, we don't know that song. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, of, of, of course, you know, you got In the Dead of Night. Mm -hmm. Great, Holdsworth's great solo. Mm -hmm. And in a different direction, Acoustic, Demiola McLaughlin oh. to Lucia, mm -hmm. Friday night in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. um, all three guys are just simply blazing. And, and it's really cool because they tell you who's playing in which channel. You got Paco de Lucia in the left channel, Al Demiola in the right channel, John McLaughlin in the center on uh, Mediterranean Sundance, Rio Ocho, the opening track. That, that's great. Those, that's what I had. Uh, also, well, Anthony said Firth of Fifth. And then, you know, in the other universe that we didn't talk about, there's stuff like Uli John Roth, the live version of Polar Nights mm -hmm. uh, from Tokyo Tapes. Virtually uh, the entire, 
Bridge of Size album from Robin Trower. Mm-hmm. One just amazing guitar solo. And then, you know, Richie, Richie Blackmore. I was thinking about like Stargazer, you know, mm-hmm. one of the great ones. I mean, he had so many. You could go through the Deep Purple catalog and, and the Rainbow catalog. So that's what I had. Cool. All right, let's see what I got here. So I've, there's a few that I have that have already been mentioned. So we got uh, Firth of Fifth, obviously. Um, Race with the Devil on Spanish Highway by Al Demi. Uh, John McLaughlin, the Mahavishnu Orchestra, Meeting of the Spirits. Nice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Martin Barr with Jethro Tull, Minstrel in the Gallery. Oh, man. And oh, yeah, that's a good one. You arguably say that Aqualung is one of the most you know mm-hmm. famous, well-constructed solos of all time, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, John Petrucci with Dream Theater, Fatal Tragedy from a Love it. Mm-hmm. To my memory. Uh, here's a good one. Miles Davis with Mike Stern on guitar, big fun. Nice. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Nice. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to do a, a two for with, with Mike Stern. Uh, title track to Upside Downside. Great song. Great solo. Gary Green with Gentle Giant, Peel the Paint. Yes, yes. I have that right here. Mm-hmm. I'm surprised no one else mentioned it. I was just about to mention that. Mm-hmm. You know what? That was in my original top five, and, uh, and it got booted for uh, Quadrant Four. It was because Gary was one that he was one of the first ones that I had to my list. In the end, I was like, "Oh, I think I got to go with the Cobham track over him." But uh, mm-hmm. still great. Uh, and Steve Howard, yes, Sound Chaser from uh, the Great Relayer album. Mm-hmm. So there you have it. All right, there you have it, everyone. So uh, I like to do this every now and then. We have a clear cut center square. So Anthony, final thoughts of the day from our center square. Oh, um, my buddy George burnt me a, a live show, speaking of Al Demula from 1980 uh, from Denver. And that was the first time I think I've ever heard uh, Alien Chase on the Arabian Desert. And that song just blew me away. So that's become one of my top five Al, Al Demula type tunes. Fantastic show, by the way. Awesome. Sounds good. Sounds good. All right. There we have it, everybody. All sorts of guitar solo talk here from our panel of experts. I want to thank everybody for watching. And uh, for those who are watching, please list your five favorite uh, guitar solos from the world of prog rock, prog metal, and jazz fusion in the comments below. Remember, there's no right or wrong answer. There's millions to choose from. And I'll be curious to see what other people come up with. So uh, thanks for watching and visit us on the web at www.catranquility.org. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter. And of course, we're here on YouTube all the damn time uh, to look for some of this stuff. I'm sure you can go over to uh, lasercd.com to find some of these wonderful albums, right? Got a few of them. Cool. I would assume so, right? Hey, if anybody's looking for the new Porcupine Tree, we started taking pre-orders on that. Okay. Wow, that's quick. All righty. I just made that announcement what two days ago and the pre-orders are already gone. Yes, actually, uh, yes, uh, actually, yes, sir. Yeah. Wow. So, yes. That's wow. Cool. Very cool. All righty. So uh, thanks for watching, everybody. Visit us on the web at www.catranquility.org. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter. Of course, we're here on YouTube all the damn time. I'm amazing. I got through this whole episode and I'm feeling okay. So mm-hmm. I think I, I think my bout of food poisoning is, is making its way through my system. And I think tomorrow... I should be back to normal. I think I'm feeling pretty close. So uh, all right. thank all these gentlemen here for helping me through this and uh, good job, everyone. So mm-hmm. thanks for watching everybody for Lewis Nasser, Stephen Reed, George Lemay, Anthony Ferrara, Chuck Alvarez, Eric Porter, and Ken Golden, I am Pete Pardo. See you all next week. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Good night. All right, guys.